Hi, I'm Gary Moody, Oboe Professor at Colorado State University. Today I'm going to discuss some ways to prepare for this year's audition material for the Colorado Allstate Ensembles. In this video, I will be dealing with the Etude from Selected Studies, page 9, which is also number 12 of the Fairling 48 Etudes. This Etude is simple rhythmically, and its biggest challenge is to perform with clean, even technique and clear articulations. Remember that even though it is marked Allegro Furioso, a slower performance with clean technique is preferable to a fast and sloppy one. Strong accents can help add to the furious nature of this piece and replace any energy lost with a slower tempo. I would like to examine this etude from the standpoint of its harmonic structure, note groupings, fingerings, breathing, as well as offer you a practice strategy for technical passages that I like to use. I believe that an understanding of the harmonic structure of melodic panards can help enhance your technical mastery of any passage, so I'd like to start with an examination of that. This etude is in D minor, so any previous practice with the D minor scale and arpeggio will give you a real head start. Additionally, the etude includes patterns using the chords that are built by stacking thirds on other notes of the D minor scale, the G minor, A major, and C sharp diminished chords. There is one additional arpeggio that is associated with the G minor scale, the F sharp diminished seventh. This copy of the etude has the arpeggios marked in. I always write in the name of the arpeggios when I find them in the music. It helps me connect all my previous practice of arpeggios to the patterns I find on the page. Some of the arpeggios are a bit hidden with neighboring or passing tones that decorate the basic arpeggio. Let's look at these more closely. The first four measures are all based on a D minor arpeggio, but also decorated as each note in the arpeggio dips down one half step to a lower neighbor and returns. Bars five, six, and seven are based on an A major arpeggio, the chord built on the fifth note of the D minor scale. This arpeggio also uses the same decoration of lower neighbors that were used in the opening measures. Bar eight outlines the C sharp diminished seventh chord with some passing tones to fill in the arpeggio. Bar nine and 10 use chords built from notes in the D and G minor scales. In bar nine, be sure to carry the F-sharp accidental across to the last 16th of beat two. Bar 11 is simply a chromatic scale with a little interruption on beat three where we backtrack to a G-sharp. Bar 12 finishes with another D minor arpeggio. I think of notes as syllables, and just as we have single and multisyllabic words, we can connect individual notes into musical words. Once I determine which notes I think belong together, I practice with a big separation between the musical words. This can also help me technically, as sometimes moving from one note to another is no longer difficult when you realize the problem connection lies between two separate musical words. I like to think of the three sixteenth notes that are slurred together in bars one, two, five, and six as pickups to the next beat so that the pattern is da, 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 da. In bar three, I group the last sixteenth of each beat with the first three sixteenths of the next beat that follows. Da, 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 da. In bar four, the final sixteenth of beat one is connected with the four sixteenths that follows. Da, 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 da. Da, 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 da. One thing that I enjoy about music is finding different ways you can connect the notes. As you explore other ways of thinking of note groupings for this piece, your understanding of it will increase. Just as articulate people speak each syllable carefully, an articulate performance will have clear distinction between tongued and slurred notes, separated with space and well-defined accents. To help guarantee the clarity of the articulation, 
I highly recommend that you practice slowly. I often tell my students that I can play fast but need to listen slowly. With slow practice, you'll be able to better hear that you are articulating correctly. This correct articulation will easily be transported into your final, faster version. Using correct fingering options and avoiding sliding of the fingers can help create a clean performance. Marking your fingerings early in your study and only practicing with those options will avoid confusion. Where you have the option of forked or left F, I recommend that you choose the one with which you are most comfortable and sticking with it. Inconsistency will only confuse your fingers. The first F in bar one should either be played with forked F or with the left F key. I like to use the left F key as it makes getting to the E and back in beat three easier. Bars three, four, 10, and 12 also need either a forked or left F to get smoothly to the Ds that follow. There are a few high notes in this piece that will be easy with the correct fingerings. Bar seven has a high E followed by a C sharp. Take the high E with the left pinky on the G sharp and alternate E flat keys so your right pinky is free for the high C sharp. Bar 12 has a high F which should be taken on the left so you can use the right pinky for the high D which follows. A smooth technical performance is one where the line is not interrupted by an unplanned breath. Planning your breaths and always breathing in those planned places will mean that your fingers will not trip over the breaths. Plan your breaths conservatively so that phrases are easy to play even on your worst day. That way, when it is time to audition and you may be a bit nervous, you won't be worrying about whether your air will last through the phrase. Here is a way to determine whether you can safely play through this exercise in one breath. Take your preferred tempo and sustain one long note for 47 beats, the length of this excerpt. Find out whether you have any breath to spare by holding the note out for any additional beats that you can. If you find yourself running out of air before the piece ends, plan intermediate points in which to breathe. You'll have a better performance by being more comfortable with a solid breath plan. Since there are no rests in this passage, any breathing will be taken by cutting a note shorter. Longer notes are generally the best places to do this, so I would breathe after the long note in bar five. If you do this, shortening the first long note in bar one will result in their lengths being consistent. There are no more long notes, so any additional breaths will have to come after 16th notes. Since the listener will hear a bump whenever the melody leaps, I would place additional breaths in bars nine and 10, where there are wide leaps from the low to the high notes. Remember how these notes were in different musical words anyway. A great practice technique I use for any pattern with steadily moving passages is to purposely change up the rhythm so that each note gets a chance to be longer than the others. For example, here is measure nine in its original rhythm, 10 variations. Practicing these bars with all 10 rhythms lets each note get its special attention and will lead to a more even final performance. Remember that slow, accurate practice beats fast, sloppy practice any day. Once your fingers clearly understand the sequence of motion, they will be able to deliver that sequence at almost any speed. Playing too fast before your fingers have that clear understanding will only result in less secure performance. I hope this video will be helpful to you in preparing for your audition. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. Good luck with your audition. Uh -huh.